right, so we're going back to Paris again. And this is the Musée d'Orsay, where they took an old you know, train station and made it into a museum. This has all the Impressionists in it. So it's, you know, the, the, if you like Impressionism, this is the place to go. And this is the inside. So you see, it's still got the characteristics of an old train station. They've got the glass atrium here, and then all the galleries are on both sides, both up and down. I mean, it's pretty amazing when you just see, you know, a thousand Impressionist paintings. So. And they've, you know, like everything else in France, it's very ornate. This is the ceiling looking back up. Extremely ornate, chandeliers. I mean, you know, not your average train station. So very, very beautiful place. And of course, it's got the murals on the ceiling. So even if you're not looking at the art, you're looking at the building that, that's housing the art. So it's a pretty cool place. All right, so we're going to talk about the retina today. And again, the saying that we said last week, what do ogres, onions, and retinas have in common? Layers, okay, layers. So first of all, we just want to look at a picture of a retina. And so we're going ahead and looking at the picture. I want you guys to realize that, that there are a couple of definitions that you need to know. And so when you're looking at a retina, in terms of the macula, you know, the retina guys define the macula as the area within the arcades. Chris, how do pathologists define the macula? Uh, it's the area with uh, uh, it's two layers of ganglion cells. Well, more than one layer. More than one layer of ganglion cells, exactly. So, um, but it pretty much course, you know, corresponds anyway. I and mean, that pretty much is the area within the arcades right here. So that's what we're talking about. All right, so we're talking about layers. And so we're going to start at the vitreous end, and then we're going to go through to the scleral end. All right, so Brad, here's the vitreous. What's the first layer right here? The ILM. All right, what's that stand for? Internal limiting membrane. All right, so the internal limiting membrane. All right, Sneha, next layer? The nerve fiber. Nerve fiber layer. We'll just go across, Rachel. Ganglion cell layer. Okay, Allie? Plexiform layer, very good. Internuclear layer. Internuclear layer. Oh, sorry, one more. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, outer plexiform layer. Outer plexiform. No, you get, we don't. Who you are? I'm Jordan, a third year med student. Oh, Jordan, okay. We don't pip students, so you're, you're saved for today. All right. Back to Chris. Uh, outer nuclear layer. Outer nuclear layer, okay. And then what are these right? Photoreceptors. Photoreceptor layer, okay? Sneha? RPE. RPE. We'll just keep going here. Rachel? Uh, Brooks membrane. Okay. No, members. Brooks membrane. Yep, that's good. Allie? All right. More specifically, right up here. Part of the choroid, but. Choreocapillaris, exactly. So it's just the, it's the innermost part of the choroid. And the reason that that's important, you see multiple little tiny capillary channels. This is where a lot of the exchange of nutrients and, and you know, removal of waste takes place. All right, so we're looking at it at a little bit higher power. Now, let's think of it functionally in, in terms of, uh, you know, what's in each layer and, and what part of it is there? In order to do that, you have to kind of think of the retina as you want to think of it as what happens to a photon of, of light. So a photon of light comes through, it's refracted by the cornea, refracted by the lens, eventually hits the retina. Now it's interesting in that the retina is upside down. The photoreceptors aren't on the inside sticking up, you know, looking where that light's coming through because they have to be extremely close to the nutrients because it's a really nutrient-rich environment. And so a photon of light comes all the way down here, and it hits some of these little outer segments of the rods and cones. So what happens at that point, Mike? So then you get conversion of cis to trans or dopsin. Okay, so you get cis to trans retinol. You get a hyperpolarization of that membrane. And then it goes through 
from the outer segments to the inner segments to the cell body here, which lives in the outer nuclear layer. All right, Chris, where does it go from there, that signal? Uh, so it goes to the inner nuclear layer after that. So where does it synapse? Uh, bipolar zone. All right, but where does the synapse first, where does, it, where does the synapse actually take place? Synapse from the rotten cone cell axons to the bipolar cells. It takes place, what's this layer here? Oh, sorry. Um, that's the, uh, that's the inner plexiform layer? The outer plexiform layer. Outer plexiform layer. So that's where the synapse takes place. And then that signal goes up to a bipolar cell, which lives right here. And then it comes out of the bipolar cell, and then where does it synapse again? The ganglion cell layer. The ganglion cell. Well, it synapses here first before it gets to the ganglion cell layer. The inner nuclear layer? Inner plex form layer. Okay. And then it gets to the ganglion cell, and then where does that axon go when it leaves the ganglion? Cells. Uh, to the nerve fiber layer. Nerve fiber layer. Now, where does that axon synapse? Um, to the pi axon. Exactly. So that axon that lives right here, it goes all the way through the nerve fiber layer, it goes through the optic nerve, it goes through the chiasm, through the radiation, all the way back to the lateral geniculate body before it synapses. And so that's a really long axon. Anything that interrupts it along that way can cause degeneration eventually of those ganglion cells. All right, now, what part of the retina are we looking at right now, Rachel? It looks like it has multiple layers of ganglion cells so we can evacuate. Exactly, so you look at the ganglion cell layer here, it's more than one cell layer thick, so you know you're in the macula. There's one other um, area that's really unique to the macula. Allie, we're looking at these fibers out here in the, in the outer plexiform layer. What's going on with those fibers there? They're going oblique, so what do we call that particular layer? Henley's layer, exactly. So again, I gotta train you guys when you do oral voice. Say it with conviction, Henley's layer, Henley's layer. You let your voice come up, you're guessing. So, Henley's layer. So, what happens is, is, if you think about it, in the center of the fovea, that's the point of where we get our, our maximum vision and our fine vision and our detailed vision. And so that is stuffed full of cones. Because you want to see every little detail, a single cone goes to a single bipolar cell, goes to a single ganglion cell. And so all those cones are stacked up and they're trying to get to all those ganglion cells which are stacked up here. So as a result, some of these fibers run obliquely. So this cone over here may link up with a ganglion cell clear over here. And so that's what's called Henley's layer where they run oblique. The reason that that's important is that layer is where cystoid macular edema occurs. When you get cystoid macular edema, it's, it's out in Henley's layer. And then again, all these ganglion cell layers are stacked up because they have to take the cones that are coming through here. Now, if you go to the peripheral retina, <coughs> peripheral retina is really to help you see, you know, your peripheral vision, help you see movement, help you see things going on out here. And so in the peripheral retina, you might have a hundred rods funneling into a single ganglion cell. And so the result of that is it summates. So I don't know if you've ever been there, you're out, it's like a, a night and you see a little light out of the corner of your vision, then you look at it and it disappears because you just, you know, it summates it so you can see it. And that's important teleologically. You want to see movement, you want to see light. You know, you're out on the tundra. And you don't want to have that saber-toothed tiger, you know, grab you and kill you. So, um, you know, you want to be able to see that movement out of the corner of your eye. So in the periphery, again, 100 rods may go into a single ganglion cell. But in the macula, one cone, one bipolar, one ganglion cell. Now, there's some other cells that live in this really, really busy layer right here, this inner nuclear layer. Um, what are some other cells that live there beside the bipolar cells? Ariana? Amacrine. Amacrine cell. Okay, another one. Horizontal cells. Horizontal cell. And one more. Uh, 
Mueller cells. And so if you think of, of the horizontal and the amacrine cells, they run parallel. They don't run perpendicular. And their purpose is, is they actually begin to summate and process site in an early phase. And so you don't actually have a signal go straight through to the brain, to the um, you know, lateral geniculate body and then the brain. There's processing going on even in the retina. So those, those amacrine cells and those horizontal cells, they'll touch multiple other processes and they are starting to <laughs> summate and to process visual, visual um, images right at that point. And then the Mueller cell is almost like a microglial cell. And so it sends its little fibers all the way up almost to the internal limiting membrane and all the way down here. Now some people call this the external limiting membrane. It's not really a membrane. It's the little junction between the cell bodies um, right here in the um, outer nuclear layer before you get the, the actual cone and rod bodies right there. So very, very busy, busy, busy layer there. So here we have the fovea. This is the center part of the, the macula. And I like to think the fovea is like wind parting a wheat field. And so you look at it, you see that it thins out here, and then all you've got is these cone bodies right here, and then the actual cones here. And so again, Henley's layer runs this way. So these cones right here may link up with those uh, ganglion cells clear out here. That just shows you again uh, Henley's layer and how that's happening. All right, so we're going to start looking at some diseases that affect the retina. Brad, what are we seeing here? Um, so we have a fundus photo of the right eye. We have um, kind of just almost uh, all four quadrants with flame-shaped hemorrhages, and then it looks like in the macula area we have some um, exudate as well. So it looks like it's like hypertensive retinopathy. Okay, now what else could this be? Um, Retinopathy. Exactly. So sometimes diabetic retinopathy. <coughs> so if you look at where the hemorrhages are, these superficial hemorrhages are shaped like flames. Why is that? Uh, because they uh, are within the nerve fiber layer. Exactly. So remember, the nerve fiber layer turns and then runs parallel to the surface. And so if there's hemorrhages there, they'll look like flames. If there's hemorrhages down deeper, they'll look like little dots and blots. And so again, this could be hypertensive retinopathy, but you know, diabetic retinopathy looks like a lot of other things too. So this technically could be diabetic retinopathy. And it turns out that that was indeed hypertensive retinopathy. Now, there are some other things that you can see with hypertensive retinopathy. Sneha, what else can you see beside the hemorrhages and the exudates? Exactly, so if you look right here, look at that optic disc. It's kind of hazy, and so that's a little bit elevated. You can get a swollen disc here. You've got the flame hemorrhages here. Interestingly enough, look at the exudate in the macula. It takes the pattern of a star, and so once again, that corresponds to Henley's layer. So you can get this star-shaped exudate. This I actually took this pic took this picture myself. Sadly, this is a um, nine-year-old kid and came in with headaches, and we happened to look in her eyes, and it had an, oh my God, measured her blood pressure, you know, 200 over 100. Turned out she'd had ureteral reflux for years, nobody knew, and she actually had severe kidney disease, and so severe hypertension. So this is what severe hypertension can look like. You can even get papilledema in addition to the hemorrhages and the macular exudates. And this is really severe. So this was a patient, again, who came in um, from the ER and came in complaining of headaches. And, you know, you guys see these people, I mean, not all the time, but not infrequently, you'll get referred from the ER, they'll have a pressure, you know, 220 over 110. This is what they can look like. Severe uh, disc swelling, loss of the margin, hemorrhages there, cotton wool spots, ischemia, and so this is severe hypertensive retinopathy. Now, this is a little bit different here. Rachel, what does this look like? What do we call that? Cherry red spot. Why does that occur? It's, um, because when you infarct the retina, um, the fovea doesn't have it. Like the, the ganglion cell layer becomes opaque and white, but you can you still have. 
have some quarter drop of Lyra's blood flow that you can kind of see through underneath the foliage just because it's thinner there and there's not. Exactly. So this is like a window. And so in the center part of the fovea, remember all those superficial retina fibers have parted. And so you don't have that ischemic retina overlying it. So you're looking at normal choroidal blood flow still, right? There. So that's the cherry red spot. So you see a hugely ischemic retina. And the common cause of that is? CRAO. CRAO, central retinal artery occlusion. What are we seeing right here, Allie? Retinal artery occlusion, exactly. So, are, are most artery occlusions embolic or thrombolic? Um, embolic. So, usually there's an emboli from somewhere carotid, aorta, valve, somewhere, a piece of cholesterol, a blood clot, something is getting in there, it's blocking them. And so, when you get it right at the optic nerve head here, you'll get a central retinal artery occlusion. When it goes down further to a branch down here, then you get a branch retinal artery occlusion. And so this is a branch retinal artery occlusion. And what am I showing right, right here, Ariana? The heck is this? Why would I show you this? Now we're looking at the histopath of the artery there. So surrounding it is, um, is nerve tissue. So we're looking at central retinal artery. So this is a, a <coughs> central retinal artery coming out of the optic nerve, and this is a person from Utah who loves to go to Crown Burgers and Moochies and all those other places that I like to take you guys to once a year and eat all that lovely high-fat diet that we all eat. And so this is severe arterial sclerosis. And so it's rare that you'll have a central artery occlusion in a normal artery. I mean, I guess, yeah, you could have a giant chunk of cholesterol break off your neck, but usually what happens is, is the artery will be narrowed and will be hardened and will be thickened with arterial sclerosis, and then you'll have this narrowed lumen and then it can block off easier. <coughs> what is this thing right here, Mike? It's like the vein. <coughs> so. Right? So the most common cause of central retinal artery occlusion, I mean, is arterial sclerosis. What's the most common cause of central retinal vein <coughs> occlusion? Also arterial sclerosis. arterial sclerosis. And so if you think about it, the vein and the artery come through together in the optic nerve when they're coming into the center of the, of the optic nerve head. And so as a result, when you have that, that big sclerotic artery pressing on the vein next to it, you can actually get stasis, which then leads to a central retinal vein occlusion. So arterial sclerosis is also the most common cause of central retinal vein occlusion because they come in together into the optic nerve sheet. All right, and this shows you what happens when you have a central retinal artery occlusion. And, and um, this kind of illustrates the blood flow to the retina. And, and Chris, what is the blood flow to the retina? The central retinal artery produces the inner one third of the retina. So here we see atrophy that the inner one third in the outer two thirds. Pretty, pretty much intact. Actually, flip that. Right? Sorry, flip, flip that. Yeah, so the central retinal artery gives you the inner two thirds gives you the outer third. So if you look right here, this is patient at central retinal artery. The ganglion cell layer, nerve fiber layer, uh, outer nuclear layer, I mean inner nuclear layer, and about two-thirds of the outer nuclear layer have been wiped out. So that's central retinal artery. Whereas the outer nuclear layer and just a little bit of the inner nuclear layer and the rods and cones get their blood from the choroid. So those are still alive. And so that's, that's choroidal blood supply still going there, but it doesn't matter because you've wiped out the retina so that you know, signal is not transmitted. So the inner two-thirds of the retina gets its blood supply from the central retinal artery, the outer third from the choroid. And what are we seeing right here? Uh, uh, right. Yeah, so it's a pretty obscure view of the entire retina. And so um, I would one of the things on my differential would be a CRVO. Um, so 
this is what they call the blood and thunder retina. I don't know what thunder means, but blood and thunder. So it's, it sounds like, you know, a defense, you know, like, ah, the Chicago Bears, blood and thunder defense. But so this is where you've got a central retinal vein occlusion and you get back up all the way through, you know, 360 degrees, back up all the way through. So very, very backed up, very damaged. So, you know, you have a wreck on the freeway, all the cars get stacked up. What is the difference here, Sneha? Uh, uh, All right, exactly. So this is a branch vein occlusion. And where does the occlusion occur in a branch vein occlusion? What specific point is susceptible for that to happen? Exactly. So if you look at this, look at this arterial, they used to call this silver wiring. And so you can actually see arterial sclerosis within the arterial here. And it's where the vein comes off and crosses over where that thick artery is. And again, it'll pinch off that vein and then that vein will block off. So again, arterial sclerosis is the cause of vein occlusion, even in a branch vein. So this, you just have a blockage in one focal area. So this is a branch vein occlusion. This just shows you in a central artery occlusion, it goes all the way to the aura serrata. So this is a globe. It's cut in half sagittally. Optic nerve back here, aura serrata up here. You see hemorrhage diffusely all the way through that globe, central retinal vein occlusion. And when you look at the path, you'll get ischemia with that, you'll get blood backed up with that. And again, it really disrupts the retina. So you can see all the way from the rods and cones to the inner part of the retina, blood all over, exudate here. Um, it really disrupts the retina. So you get ischemia, you can get um, other problems as the blood just doesn't get out of there. All right, what are we seeing right here, Allie? diabetic retinopathy. What is this right here? Very subtle, but there it is. A little cotton wool spot. And so this, this well, well, we'll pretend that's not there. This, this would be what we call background retinopathy. But there is, this is getting more into a little bit of even pre-proliferative retinopathy. But this kind of illustrates the different changes in the background retinopathy. So the first thing that happens is, for some reason, the pericytes get affected that surround the little um, arterioles. And then what you do is you get these little microaneurysms forming. So this is a trypsin digest of the blood supply in the, in the retina itself. And you see these little microaneurysms. So that's the first thing that you see in background diabetic retinopathy is the microaneurysms. And then you can get the hemorrhages, dot blot, flame hemorrhages. What is all this stuff right here, um, Ariana? All right, so you can also get a tremendous amount of heart exudate. And if it's here in the macula, you can imagine that that's going to cause a lot of issues with the vision. And so it's a sign of diffuse leakiness of the vessels. And so you get leakage of all this fluid through there. Eventually, some of the fluid gets reabsorbed, but the lipids, the proteins, other stuff like that does not get reabsorbed. So it ends up depositing in the retina. So the heart exudate gets deposited in the, in the retina. And this is what it looks like. Here's the retina and cross section again. This eosinophil staining material, this is hard exudate. I don't know why they call it hard, because they used to call cotton wool spots soft exudates. It's not an exudate. So, but in any event, it's hard exudate. So that's what it looks like right there. All right, now what do we see in here? This looks like a fundus photo left eye of and you got those cotton wool spots. Cotton everywhere. wool spots. So if you look at them, they're different. They're not that yellow hard exudate inside the retina. It's almost like it's descriptive. It's like someone took a little fluffy piece of cotton and put it on the surface of the retina. Why is that? Um, it's because it's more uh, kind of inner retina in the inner retinal vitreoli. And what, is, what causes it's it? It's an infarct in that area. Exactly. So it's, it's an ischemic infarct. And so when you look at it right here, what a cotton wool spot is, is it's swollen 
ganglion cells and nerve fiber layer. So it looks as if it's on the surface of the retina. And when you get that acute blockage, that acute infarct, then it swells. Now those can go away. They can wax and wane, but unfortunately leave permanent damage in that spot. It's tough to pick up, but sometimes if you do a multifocal ERG, really specifically, you can pick up some little areas of damage. And so a cotton wool spot is a focal area of ischemia of the inner retina. Now you see in close-up, these are these swollen, sorry, I copied this out of a book. I didn't get a beautiful slide like this. This is swollen ganglion cells here and nerve fiber layer. So that's an ischemic swollen cotton wool spot. What are we seeing right here? Chris? We're seeing, it looks like proliferative retinopathy, so we're seeing areas of neovascularization and given it looks like maybe a cotton wool spot. So, maybe it's okay. so what do we call this now? This would be part of it, and so we divide it into NV D and NVE. So neovascularization of the disc and neovascularization elsewhere. So this is NVE, neovascularization elsewhere. So you get chronic ischemia, ischemic factors are produced, they cause abnormal blood vessels to grow, and so you get this neovascularization elsewhere. But also you can get this. Brad, what is this? NVD. NVD, neovascularization of the disc, and we call this the Medusa's head. Remember Medusa from Greek mythology? The lady had all the snakes coming out of her head. So this looks like Medusa right here. You've got all this neovascularization right here, and so this is NVD. Why is that an issue? It can bleed. Exactly. It can bleed, it can cause scarring, it can cause all kinds of problems because those abnormal vessels are not mature. They don't have pericytes around them. They leak like crazy. And in fact, you can get this. And so you get hemorrhage, you get gliosis, you get traction, you can get a retinal detachment because of this, a traction retinal detachment. And you can even get this. Sneha, what kind of hemorrhage is this called? Boat shape. So you see it's flat on top. Round on the bottom. Why is that? Exactly. So this is actually pre-retinal. So it's in front of the retina, between the retina and the vitreous, and so the blood will leak downward, but then it'll have this flat top on top. So this is NVD causing pre-retinal hemorrhage, and so it can cause severe hemorrhage if you don't treat that. What else does this cause, Rachel? Neovascularization of the iris. Neovascularization of the iris. So we call this rubiosis iris, and we used to call this ropiosis, you know, because it looks like big ropes all over. So when you get chronic ischemia, not only does it stimulate abnormal blood vessels to grow inside the retina, but it stimulates abnormal blood vessels to grow on the iris. And so you can get severe neovascularization of the iris, and just remember from last week, you can also get neovascular glaucoma. So here's the blood vessels on the surface of the iris. That membrane is pulling the pigment epithelium around the corner. So when you look, you'll actually have a little black border. What do we call that to the iris? Ectropion uva, exactly. So it pulls the black border iris anteriorly. So that's from neovascularization. And there you can see where the neovascularization is actually closed the angle. So just like we talked about last week, secondary angle closure glaucoma. Now, diabetes can cause other things going on inside the eye besides just the retina. What the heck is this picture, Allie? What's going on here? It's showing a picture of the iris, and it looks like there's, like, vacuolization of it. Exactly. So you can get this focal vacuolization of the iris pigment epithelium. They call this lacy vacuolization, and that's a sign of, of diabetes. Ariana, what am I looking at right here? This is pars plicata, and uh, we are still looking at neovascularization, I think, in those red areas. Okay, look closer. What kind of stain is this? What does PAS stain? It's membrane. 
basement membrane. So what happens in diabetes in the ciliary body? It's thickened. Exactly, it becomes thickened. So you see, this is the basement membrane of the ciliary body epithelium. Look how thick that is. And so when I was a fellow, I hadn't done my residency yet. So David Apple um, was too busy doing IOLs. He didn't want to get path. So the American Board of Ophthalmology said, hey, can you send us some good path pictures we can put on boards? And so he said, Nick, you do it, you do it, you do it. So I took a bunch of good pictures, and so I actually took a picture just like this and submitted it to the board. And so when I was a senior resident, I, my picture was on OCAPS. And so I looked and I said, all right, thickened basement membrane, diabetes, I got this cold. And then, you know, as you guys, if you haven't taken these OCAPS yet, you'll love them because OCAPS ask two-part questions. So you look at this, you say, I've got this, this is a diabetic. And then they'll say, a patient with this picture would have, you know, A, peritoneal nerve velocity of, you know, B, creatinine clearance of, and then you're like, oh, shoot. You know, what is a slow peritoneal nerve? What is decreased clearance? And so they ask two-part questions. So it's really not fair. You get it right, and then you still don't get it right. So you guys who are more seniors, you'll love taking this. It's great. So this, this was funny because this picture actually showed up on boards when I, on the OCAPs when I was a senior. So thickened basement membrane of the ciliary body. All right, how do we treat this? What the heck is this? This looks like laser treatment. All right, so it's interesting. When people first started getting lasers, the first ophthalmic laser in the 19, late 1960s was a xenon arc laser. This thing would blast a thousand micron you know, thing that would like melt lead. I mean, it was this really, um, really, really, you know, bright spot. And interestingly, when they first started trying to treat neovascularization of the iris, they would treat the neo itself. Theory being that the, the um, laser would actually, you know, seal off the neovascularization. So they blasted the optic nerve head with this laser. Well, of course, people went blind from that. But people were also using the xenon arc in the periphery, blasting neovascularization in the periphery. And what they found was after that, the neovascularization on the disc went away. So then they finally figured out, wait a minute, this isn't sealing off the abnormal blood vessels. This is actually treating ischemic retina, which then decreases the ischemic factors, which then causes the neovascularization to recede. So, you know, right now, of course, we've got the injections that people are using, so we're seeing less less laser treatment, but the idea was you would treat the entire peripheral retina to save the central <clears throat> retina. And so you would sacrifice that peripheral retina, but then the neovascularization on the disc and the macula and all would shrink up and you'd save your central vision. So this is what the laser spots would look like. When you look at it pathologically, you know, when you look now we use an argon laser, it basically works by being absorbed by pigment. And so here's the normal retina over here, here's RPE, outer retina, here's where a laser spot is. You see it basically wipes out the RPE and a lot of the external retina. It kind of seals off the choriocapillaris, but as a result of that, it will decrease the um, factors that are being put out that cause the blood vessels to grow. Some people also say it might increase oxygenation into the retina from the core too, but in any event, <coughs> it does work when you do peripheral panretinal laser photocoagulation for neovascularization. All right. What? Wait, let's see. Do you do that last one? That's fine. Okay, Chris, what is this? Uh, so here we're seeing, this is an FA. Um, and here we're seeing this kind of peripheral, kind of C-fan appearance. Uh, there's capillary non-perfusion and drop-out <laughs> discal that. So you know, we can see stuff like this in sickle cell. We can see this in Neal's disease. Uh, kind of be a couple that come to mind right away. Good. So this, as you look at it, it's dark in the periphery because that retina is totally ischemic. And then right at the border zone between the ischemic retina and the perfused retina, you get this CFAN neovascularization. And this indeed was a, a patient with sickle cell. And so you know, we don't see sickle cell much in Utah because we don't have a lot of African Americans in Utah. But in Chicago, we used to see tons of sickle cell. And basically what happens is, you know, when these uh, RBCs sickle, it causes capillary um, you know, blockage and then causes chronic ischemia. This is actually this knobby, 
appearance you get in the retina, again, in trypsin digest, this knobby appearance that you get in people with sickle cell. There's a really rare condition called Eels disease, again, that can do that. You know, nowadays, it's interesting when you're looking at people treating retinopathy prematurity with injections, you're sometimes now getting these little C fans in the area between perfuse retina and non-perfuse retina in premature infants. And so same idea. All right, this is kind of subtle. What the heck is... So it looks like we have a macular hole with maybe a little bit of surrounding subretinal fluid. Exactly. So that looks like pretty much a full thickness macular hole. And then you do see that little cuff of, of fluid surrounding it. And here's a close-up. What is that thing? Rod. Exactly. So sometimes people look at and say, oh, I don't know. It's that focal area of extra day. I don't know. So that's actually the fixation rod. Sometimes these people can't hold the eye still, so you give them a rod to look at. But again, you see this full thickness macular hole and this little cuff of edema surrounding it. And I apologize. This is an old AFIP slide I took a picture of because I really, you know, you don't need nucleate eyes for macular holes. And so um, this is kind of the edge of a macular hole, and here's the edema that you've got, that little cup of edema next to it. All right, boy, this is even more subtle. Sneha, what is this? Um, this looks like... Good, so you see that little kind of subtle wrinkling, and you see the little accordioning of the vessels, and so epiretinal membrane will give you this. And, this one's a little bit more prominent, so hopefully you wouldn't miss this one. This would be one maybe an intern could see, you know, hopefully. Maybe even a student, I don't know. This would be a student's one. And so you can see the wrinkling that you, oops, let's go back. So you see the wrinkling, and you can see, the, again, the, the corkscrewing of the vessels. That's an epiretinal membrane, and as it constricts, you'll get distortion, and the patient will complain of metamorphopsia. And then, uh, what kind of picture is this that, that highlights that, Rachel? It's a ret-free. And so, if you do a ret-free photograph, it really tends to highlight the epiretinal membrane. And you can see how the vessels, sometimes they get pulled in to the center of it. So sometimes the peripheral vessels get elongated as they get pulled into this mass right here. And of course, nowadays we've got you know OCT, which just shows it beautifully. And so you'll see the wrinkling on the surface of the OCT as you go through the center of where that epiretinal membrane is. And again, you can just see again, here's the OCT here, the wrinkling of the retina underlying it. And so that's the epiretinal membrane. Now, again, I had to take a picture of this from a book because I don't get a lot of path with an epiretinal membrane on it, but sure enough, here's the membrane on the surface of the retina. You know anymore, the OCTs are so good to get a path picture with the OCT anyway. What do we see in here, Allie? Looks like a lot of drusen in the macula. All right, so some drusen in the macula. What exactly are drusen? Oops, products. Okay, and where do they live? What part of the retina are they in? They're in the RPE. Well, yeah. They're actually under the RPE. This is a good place to shove this in. A pimp question that I forgot to even mention. Oh my goodness, a, a pimp question. So how many layers does Brooks membrane have? Brooks membrane is between the RPE and the choroid. Five, and what are they? There's two basement membranes on each side, one of the RPE, one of Brooks, or the choroid, and then elastic, two elastic layers, and then Collagen in the middle. Flip that last part. Two collagen, Two and, collagen an elastic. and elastic. In the middle. All right, so the way you remember it, it's, it's a turkey sandwich. Bread and bread, you know, turkey, collagen, you know, really bad turkey sandwich, really hard collagen. And then the elastic layer in the middle is a layer of cheese. And so you've got the elastic layer in the middle, two layers of collagen, then basement membrane of the RPE, basement membrane of the choreo capillaire. So technically, these drusen are actually intra-brooks because they're really under the basement membrane of the RPE. So sometimes they may pimp you on that. So you know it's under the RPE and you can say, well, technically, if you want to impress you know, the attending that's asking, you say, well, technically, 
it's actually intrabrooks because it's under the basement membrane. And then they'll go, oh, yeah, okay. So you get extra points for it. And then they'll stop pimping you. So it's, it's good. So you get points for that. So you can see this deposition. And again, it's this waste material. There's a lot of lipofusin in it. There's some lipid in it. It's kind of a buildup of waste materials, if you will, underneath the RPE. And then this is what we call a soft drusen. And so the little focal ones are what we call hard drusen, but you can get more diffuse drusen that we call soft drusen because they're even bigger and have less distinct borders. And this is what they look like. And here's the RPE over here. It really disrupts things. And of course, if you can imagine, if it's disrupted the RPE, eventually the overlying retina is going to die off and you're going to lose vision in that area. And these are some softer drusen. They're just not quite so distinct soft drusen. And here you can see diffuse soft drusen, you know, degenerative RPE cells overlying them, choriocapillaries down here. You can see where that could cause quite a bit of disruption. Ariana, what are we seeing here? Uh, there are pigment changes, very dark, mottled RPE. What else? I know it's kind of subtle because this is a lighter, a lighter fundus. Um, and we call atrophy. Yeah, so we call this geographic atrophy. So, you know, it's hard to see because it's a light fundus. Believe it or not, the RPE is completely wiped out all through here and then there's some pigment at the edges and so this is what we call geographic atrophy so you don't get neovascularization but you get the RPE just gets diffusely wiped out and then the retina overlying it of course gets wiped out you look at the pathology here there's Brooks man there's just you know there's some Drews in here but boy there's just no RPE there at all it's totally wiped out and as a result the retina overlying it. Look how it's all vacuolated. So the retina gets completely wiped out overlying it. So that's geographic atrophy. What are we seeing right here? This looks like some uh, atrophy and then neovascularization there. What makes you say there's neovascularization? So the other thing you see, see this kind of greenish gray around here? When you get blood under the retina, especially under the RPE, it'll look kind of greenish gray rather than red. And so this is subretinal neovascularization. It can be subretinal, it can even be sub RPE. And so this is kind of the most advanced stage of macular degeneration. And again, I had to copy this out of a book. It's a beautiful picture. So there you see, here's choroid. Here's Brooks membrane. Here is RPE really disrupted and some gliosis here. And look, here's a break in Brooks. And here's neovascularization growing up through Brooks membrane under the RPE and then forming this gliotic membrane. So that's subretinal neovascularization. And of course, this is severe. So this is now broken through under the retina where it's red. And then the grayish dark one is actually sub RPE. So this is subretinal neovascularization. Now, most common cause of subretinal neovascularization is obviously AMD. What's another cause, Chris? Uh, so you trauma. Uh, trauma, you can get a focal choroidal rupture can do that. For choroidal neovascularization? Yep, for yeah, subretinal neovascularization. Um, so, I mean, you have a lot of things. Uh, histo? Yep. Presumed ocular histo can do that too. And so, um, Sneha, another thing that can cause subretinal neo in the macula. Yeah. How about something looking around this room that's exceedingly common in this room right now? Myopia. So, myopia can cause it too, severe myopia. So, lots of causes of subretinal neo. But, of course, the most common one that we see is, is actually due to macular degeneration. And here you see, this is what we call a discoform scar. So eventually when you get that bleeding, you get the astrocytes proliferating, you get gliosis, and you get this scar underneath the retina. So this will often look white. It'll look like just a big scar. All right, what do we see in 
right here, Rachel. Where is there uh, like yellowish, whitish spots that are kind of scattered? Uh, a couple of them have some associated uh, pigment with them as well. What do you think this could be? Yeah, so Brad did mention this, so he kind of stole your thunder here, but you see these peripheral, they call them punched out lesions, these little peripheral punched out lesions, but you can also get, you know, macular lesions with this too, and, and they say presumed ocular histo because it's, you don't actually go in there and biopsy it and find an active histo in there, and so, um, but this is common in the histo belt, you know, it's kind of in the Midwest, in the uh, upper Midwest, Ohio River Valley, you know, wherever you get histo. Usually don't see this much here. I, I mean, to be honest, I don't see retina. I mean, I'm not a retina specialist, I'm a general ophthalmologist, but I, I can count the amount of histo patients I've seen in the last 30 years on one hand. I mean, I've probably seen three or four. It's a very uncommon, but you get these peripheral punched out lesions, and then you can get subretinal neo and, and um, macular lesions. All right, this is kind of weird looking alley. What are we seeing here? Yeah, you're losing that nice little dimple and that reflex of the phobia. So what do you think could be going on in here? Edema. Edema. All right, so we look at it, and sure enough, this is something now with OCT you guys may never see. I don't know, do you still have fluorescein conferences? Do they still do fluorescein at fluorescein conferences? All right, so what have we got here? Yeah, you kind of get that flower petal shape, and so this is classic cystoid macular edema. And where did we say that the exudate is located? Henley's layer. Henley's layer, and sure, there it is. All right, so there's Henley's layer, <coughs> and sure enough, there's the exudate. We're in the macula because the ganglion cell layer is more than one cell layer thick, and you can see here's the exudate in Henley's layer. So cystoid macular edema. What's the most common causes of cystoid macular edema? Diabetes could be. Uh, Post-op. All right, so you get, they used to call it Irvine gas syndrome. So anything that causes breakdown, chronic breakdown of the blood aqueous barrier, eventually you can get breakdown of the blood retinal barrier and you can get cystoid macular edema, so it can be post-op. What else? Get it from VMT, traction, right? Yeah. Exactly. So any kind of uveitis, any kind of chronic inflammation can give you cystoid macular edema also. So most common things we see is, of course, post-op, because even if it's only in 1% or 2% of cataract patients, it's still a large amount of people. But again, any uveitis, any inflammatory condition in the eye can cause this. Diabetics can get cystoid macular edema. All right. Boy, that's kind of subtle. Um, Brad, what are we seeing here? Let me do this next one, and that'll help you a little bit. That's bullseye. Exactly. So if you go back, sometimes bullseyes are hard to see, and so this is called bullseye maculopathy. And if you do a fluorescein angiogram, now, is that leakage? No. What is it? Window defects. Exactly. So you get these window defects, and so you'll get choroidal uh, fluorescence showing up, and then this dark goes on around it. So what are some of the things that can cause bullseye maculopathy? Okay, so Plaquenil is the biggest one now because we see a lot of people on Plaquenil. We worry about that. What else? You, like some code for broad dystrophies can cause uh, mm -hmm. bullseye. Exactly. Dystrophies. What are their medications? Uh, so you have chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine. Um, uh, other anti-rheumatoid arthritis drugs. Well, actually, old old, old um, antipsychotics could cause this too. Old, old antipsychotics and some of the older um, medicines they used to give people for depression can do these too. So the idea now with Plaquenil is we see these people early and we go ahead and we do a central 10-2 um, visual field in the center. We do OCT of the macula. We give do multifocal ERGs. We look for early signs because 
once it gets to this point, the damage is done. So again, the horse is out of the barn. That doesn't do you any good to treat it there. So you want to prevent it. So I see a ton of Plaquenil people in clinic that we do these testing on every year just to make sure. What do we see in here? Sneha. kind of these weird looking streaks. Those really aren't blood vessels. What the heck are those? Uh, yeah, angioid streaks, or some people call them lacquer cracks. But so, where do they occur? Where's the pathology? In Brooks. And so you get a little focal break in Brooks membrane, and these are called angioid streaks. And what's an entity they always pimp you on boards that could cause this? This is called the plucked chicken skin on the neck. I don't know, we don't pluck chickens in. This is, this is pseudoxanthoma elasticum. And so that'll cause angioid streaks. Sickle cell can cause angioid streaks. What is this, Rachel? Real pale nerve, chalky white. <coughs> Really attenuated. What would this be? Something like RP. Exactly. So this is retinitis pigmentosa. And if we look further in the periphery, you get what's called the bony spicule uh, pigment, disruption of the pigment. Why is that? Well, what happens is the degenerative RPE releases the pigment, the pigment deposits along the vessels. And so that's why you get this bony spicule pattern. So here, is the retina, it's really wiped out and you get these pigment um, granules that are depositing around the vessel so you get that bony spicule pattern and that's retinitis pigmentosa, RP. What do we see in here, Allie? An egg-shaped lesion? Yeah, it looks like a sunny side up egg. What gives you that look to the macula? Best. Best disease. And so this is one of those things, nothing else looks like this. And so I, I tell you my favorite, Ray Font was the pathologist in Baylor. He's from Cuba. He has a really good Cuban accent. And his favorite saying for a classic picture is, is your brother in the train station? And you say, what the hell does that mean? OK, you know, you go to the train station. You see 1,000 people. How you know your brother? Because only your brother looks like this. And so only is your brother in the train station. Only best looks like this. So this is classic best disease. And you see this deposit of this material underneath the RPE here. What have we got here, Ariana? You see the, this form flex of star guard. Yeah, so what does piece of form mean? Fish. Fish-like. So it supposedly looks like little, you know, those little goldfish you'd eat when you were a kid, you know? The, Parents would give you to quiet down, so it kind of looks like those little goldfishes on here. So this is what we call Stargardt's disease, or fundus flava, flavi maculatum. And it's characterized by a deposition of lipofusin and pigment granules in the RPE. And so that is fundus flavi maculatum. Boy, this is not out of focus, Mike. What are we looking at here? So the media looks like there's blood, and then you can also see a white streak across. Yeah, so the media is really hazy. Look, there's the disc, and there you see this little area here, and everything's there is foggy, so they call this the headlight in the fog. What is classically producing the headlight in the fog? It seems like a vitreous hemorrhage with maybe a beer. Well, but you wouldn't really see that whitening so much with the vitreous hemorrhage. So this is what that spot looks like when the vitreous clears up. That is active toxoplasmosis. toxoplasmosis. And so toxoplasmosis, you know, people probably get this. They can even get it congenitally, get it as kids. These little toxocysts live in the retina, and then for some reason they'll activate. And so when you get the active so you get a, a, you know, vitritis associated with it. So you get the headlight in the fog, and then eventually you get
get this area with these lacunar wiped out areas of pigment that's actually scleral showing through. So that's end stage toxoplasmosis. When you look at the pathology, here's a little bit of RPE here and then right where the toxo was, it just wipes out the RPE, wipes out the retina. And so sometimes you'll see if these people get it activated, you'll see an old scarred lacunar area and then you'll see this fuzzy area next to it where some of those cysts that have sat there dormant for years come back to life. So that's chronic toxoplasmosis. Uh, what could this be, Chris? Um, so this is probably something else infectious. This kind of looks like that tomato ketchup fungus we read about. So this could be seen in deer retinitis. Yeah, so people love, people love to describe things with food, you know, so tomato ketchup or pizza retina look. So this is indeed CMV. Now, I didn't, we didn't even know what CMV was when I was a resident, but there was this bizarre disease that these gay guys in California were getting. And so it turned out HIV, AIDS, one of the things you would get is you would get, um, you know, this chronic CMV retinitis. And so this is actually, again, it's blurry because I actually took this. So I took this as a resident. So this is the first case of CMV we ever saw. And what you can see is CMV, it's interesting, it's like a lot of the other herpes, fa herpes families. You can actually get intra, um, you know, nuclear and intracytoplasmic <coughs> inclusions. So you get inclusions both in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm of the retinal cells. Now, fortunately now with people being treated with triple therapy, their immune systems are better, you don't see this as much. But still, even in immunosuppressed people, cancer people who are on chemotherapy, you can sometimes see CMV. And we say goodbye. This is the IMP's pyramid. And this here's that louver. You know, there's the louver there in Paris. It's the IMP's pyramid. And then you've kind of got, interesting, almost this kind of Roman, you know, arch coming into it, almost Germanic Roman. But this is all the louver right here. And there's IMP's pyramid, which is now the new entrance. Okay, so next week is optic nerve. So know your optic nerves, okay? Questions? And well, you're two minutes over. So yep, you guys are ready.